With us, we have uh, Terry Juliana or Weaver. Hello, Juliana. Hi. It's great to have you with us. It's a great honor. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Seeing a person like that who has devoted her whole self in, in the vocations of the mind and in uh, scientific research and methodology to find the truth about life, at the same time, you're a deeply religious, a deeply spiritual person. When and how did you make that choice? You know, was it a conscious choice or was it uh, something inherited by your parents? Well, I'm, a, I'm an Orthodox Christian and it, it was a conscious choice to become a Christian, um, but it was really independent of my family. So when I was a small child, I uh, had these very real, uh, intense, uh, spiritual experiences um, and my parents were not Christians uh, they had dropped me off at a church um, and I learned about Christianity through that church and it was a conscious decision to become a Christian uh, but it was based in uh, these profound and very real uh, spiritual experiences through your whole life, you're experimenting, you're mapping life and the natural causes and the evolution of life through science. How do you balance these two mentalities and, and realities, let's say? Well, I, I realize that there are different ways of knowing and they're asking different questions. So, as you said, uh, science is empirical knowledge, you know, it's derived from working within a set of assumptions and designing objective experiments uh, to test hypotheses and uh, trying to be as objective as possible um, in analyzing the results. And so science is working within a set of assumptions and the th discoveries that are made are true within those set of assumptions. And so there are scientific facts that are, are true. But science is asking, how does the material world work? Uh, it's asking the physical properties of the material world. I think of that sort of as a sphere, but that's not the limit of knowledge. And that's not the limit of type of knowledge. And that's not, that sphere also is not the limit of truth. So I think of science as a sphere within a much larger sphere. And there's um, a different set of knowledge. Um, we could call it noetic knowledge, I guess, um, that is based on experience. It's not based on deductive reasoning, um, but it's nevertheless valid and true. And, you know, in a sense, what spirituality is, ask, is asking and answering is different. It's, it's asking the why. Why do we exist? What's the purpose of our lives? What's our relationship to God? These are the why questions that faith poses and has the answers to um, are outside of the sphere of uh, scientific knowledge and neither invalidates the other. I think that's, you know, where the tension between uh, faith and science comes in is the idea that only one can be true um, and that's not the case you know the scientific facts and truths that are defined within this in a set of assumptions are true um, but that doesn't uh, exclude the possibility that outside of that uh, sphere there's another type of knowledge that's gained in a different way um, that's experiential but is also true. 
you know, if science is true, that doesn't invalidate my faith, and my faith is not threatened or invalidated by scientific discoveries about the physical world. Another big question for me is, I usually wonder, you know, how much um, of religion, what percentage of religion is man-made and how much is God-made? Um, because, you know, you don't really know the scriptures. Are, are they, you know, divine, in a way, a divine direction? Is it man-made? How much is it exploited, possibly, through the ages from emperors or from people in power to motivate the masses for whatever reason? So, how do, and in general, I know of many people who believe in God, but they don't really believe the scriptures as factual information, but rather as allegories that explain the soul in a way. What, what, is, what is your stand on that? Well, you know, I'd say that there's a lot, a lot to say in response to this. Um, I can't really address other religions because I don't really know much about them. So I can, I can really only talk about Christianity. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, Christianity is a relationship with Christ. And the purpose of, of the church is to help us grow in that relationship through church tradition and um, the many helps that, uh, and many ways that the church provides us to be able to learn about Christ and to deepen that relationship. And so, you know, religion as a man-made construct that can be political or, you know, almost function like a government is not really true spirituality and a faith. And, you know, we can see that in the life of Christ. Uh, Christ overturned the laws. You know, he, he wasn't constrained by these religious rules. He, you know, he greatly upset uh, the Jewish leaders of his day um, by, you know, really realizing what mattered was love and sacrifice uh, for those around him. You know, that it mattered uh, to heal someone even if it was on the Sabbath. And so I guess, you know, viewing my faith as a relationship really gives a perspective on these, this, these things that can be kind of man-made about religion and, you know, a set of rules that, you know, anytime it takes away from this core of love and a relationship, then I think it's, it's not helpful. In terms of scripture, you know, you, you, I think you really alluded to the critical thing that happened in the West. And what's helpful for us, um, you know, when we think about this false dichotomy that's happened in the West uh, between science and spirituality is to look to the East, and in the case of the Christian church, to look earlier. And so uh, in the early Christian church, there, there wasn't conflict between science and the Christian faith. Uh, so for example, St. Basil, you know, one of the really great, St. Basil the Great, <laughs> one of the most important um, church fathers, really valued science. Um, he really weighed scientific laws, um, uh, you know, in his, his treatise on the creation, he really um, valued and, and thought through what the scientific establishment of his day and of the ancient Greeks had asserted about the science of how the universe came to be. And he, you know, he taught people to value secular knowledge and to make use of secular knowledge um, uh, and to find ways that secular knowledge could, could help them in their spiritual growth. So there really wasn't this antagonism because there was inherently this understanding um, that scientific exploration of the material world 
was true and was defining the properties of the material world, but that spirituality uh, could, you know, was a larger sphere and that God was not constrained by the material laws of the, of the physical world and of the universe. So, um, you know, as you mentioned, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it might be helpful for just us to dis discuss it further, there was a real change in, in the West that um, began with the Renaissance, uh, really was, uh, ultimately, you know, was really the, promoted and a consequence of the scientific revolution where the principles of scientific discovery were really worked out and put into practice with such tremendous effect in physics, biology, you know, many, many areas. And the consequence was that people sort of wholeheartedly adopted uh, the scientific method to other aspects where it's really not applicable. You know, so the, the idea in the West, uh, kind of post-enlightenment, would be everything can be approached and understood through deductive reasoning through the scientific method, right? That included um, how language works, uh, uh, that in included, importantly, how one uh, understood scriptures and the Bible. That, you know, the idea became that you could apply the scientific method to understand the Bible. And, you know, the, the Eastern Church sort of never fell captive to that. And so it was never, um, it never kind of fell into the same uh, antagonism between the scientific method and faith and understanding of scriptures. Uh, so, you know, the Bible is not a science textbook. It doesn't, the Bible does not inform us about science. And the early fathers understood this. For example, St. Athanasius, when he wrote about creation, uh, you know, this is fourth century, I guess, said, you know, we can't assume that the day referred to in the Genesis account of creation is a 24-hour day. We have no idea what it what it was. You know, we can't think about it uh, in terms of the scientific laws. Um, so, I, th I think that's where you know, as a society, we've kind of unconsci unconsciously got uh, sort of gotten caught um, into you know this idea that only you know only one thing can be true um and so i don't you know the way i tr under try to understand scriptures is not falling into this idea that i can apply deductive reasoning and the scientific method to understand them i can't just take each word and translate it and take the definition of each word and somehow sum them in a sentence independent of context and importantly, independent of church tradition, and think that I can use that as a guide and I can use that as a scientific text. That's not how I look at scripture at all. Absolutely. One, one of the things that for me is, is another pain point of religion uh, in the sense of, actually not of religion, but of spirituality, of expanding spirituality to as many people as possible is the fact that some religion, and especially, I guess, again, Western approaches, is that they have treated some segments of people, some people, basically, in a not very friendly way. For example, you know, religion approach to gay people, or even to women, or, or to sensitive issues like abortion, sometimes have pushed people away. So, where do you draw the line between what, you know, uh, religion dictates, let's say, and what you find as ethical? I draw the line with love and, you know, I fail at this all the time, um, uh, but love and lack of judgment, you know, that our response 
to all, all those people around us who are brought into our lives has to be to recognize them as individuals and to respond to them with love in a non-judgmental way. And I think that has to be our response, is that response of love and non-judgmental and not slipping into really identifying people by labels. A very powerful thing of spirituality is prayer. And I wanted to ask you, you know, what, what do you feel about prayer? And is there something that, what, what is the secret power of praying? And is there in a way a corridor between the conscious self and the bigger being and the, uh, the bigger entity, which is, which is God? And is there a scientific, let's say, approach to that? I don't think prayer can be um, understood or defined scientifically. You know, it's one of those things that are outside of the sphere of um, uh, objective empirical science. Uh, prayer is a conversation with a person, uh, for us Christians, with the person of Christ. Um, it's a way for us to really open our hearts, um, and to learn to be willing and to be able to listen. Uh, so it's a conversation, but the key thing is for us to learn how to be still and to listen so that we can learn about um, and experience the person of Christ. Speaking of um, staying still and, and, and talking with Christ, I think that, you know, the rational self, our rational self, uh, we have learned how to educate it. You know, we have institutions, we have schools, we have universities, we have the workplace. Is there a way that you think we can train our, our soul, our spirituality? One thing that's always been uh, stressed through the centuries in the Christian church, you know, in the Orthodox church is, is the Christian church really going back to its foundations, has been the idea of not having a fragmented life, of really unifying our life. Uh, and so not having our life be split between the secular and the spiritual, but to really uh, bring these together, again, recognizing there are these different kinds of knowledge, but to really have all of our life um, uh, be transformed so that we, we aren't fragmented people who go off to work and sort of leave our spirituality at home. Uh, we, we're really uh, growing towards being a unified, um, cohesive, integrated person. Um, in terms of growing, growing our souls, as you said, um, it's a, it's a hard process, and I wouldn't want to go it alone. I think having a spiritual guide, um, an elder, a spiritual father, or a spiritual mother, uh, is really crucial because it's it's first of all it's so easy uh, to deceive ourselves. Um, it's easy to get off on the wrong track. And it's very, very difficult to know ourselves and to see ourselves as we truly are. And so finding a, a guide um, is a way for us to learn, but also to begin to be able to see ourselves um, and really see who we really are and what needs to be changed. If you, if you see many religions, and if you see our, our religion, Christian Orthodoxy, you see some patterns that, that you can maybe find in other religions as well, like the resurrection, the ark. Uh, all this, you can find it in some way in many religions. 
And some people go as far as to say that, you know, um, religions are the doors to the same house, let's say. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of that? I can't really speak about a lot of different religions um, just from lack of knowledge and lack of exposure and lack of experience. What really um, impacts me about Christianity is that it's a relationship. You know, that's the, the basis of Christian spirituality is it's a relationship. And what Christianity says is instead of saying, if you don't agree with me and you don't agree with my religion, I'm going to kill you. What true Christianity says is, if you don't agree with me and you don't agree with my religion, I will die for you, which is what Christ did. Uh, and through the centuries, thousands and thousands of Christians did. That, you know, when someone didn't agree with their religion, they were willing to die for that person. And this isn't some historical thing that just happened uh, in the Roman Empire. Um, you know, in the 20th century, thousands and thousands of Christians died for their enemies, died for people who didn't agree with them. Um, uh, for example, in the Communist Soviet Union, there were thousands and thousands of martyrs. So that is a striking aspect of uh, Christianity um, that, you know, is a really fundamental aspect of it as a religion. Scientists and people of faith um, have a lot to offer and, and you know, both have the same fundamental goal, which is to improve the world and to improve the lives of, of humans. So that, you know, that there's a shared mission and goal um, between the scientific community and between people of faith. Totally agree. Juliana, thank you so much. Okay, it was a pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Great having you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>